empowering the blind to be excellent, do more, and live with greater success. This show is for you and about you. Welcome to the Delivering Access Podcast. All right, Delivering Access land, this is Vashon Jones back again with another exciting podcast. This week, our guest is Mrs. Debbie Hazelton. Debbie, are you prepared to empower? I am indeed. All right. Well, we're going to dive right in and we're going to ask Debbie where she grew up, how she became blind, and some of the tools that she's used along her way. So take it away, Debbie. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, it is Ms. Hazelton. I'm not Mrs. Um, that would be my mother. <laughs> right. And, and um, I was born three months premature, and I was born in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, I was born in the, I would say, the looking good era where parents, even still in many ways now, don't know, but did certainly not know what in the world to do with blindness. Uh, and a child who's blind, fortunately, I went to regular, I went to nursery school, I went to kindergarten, public school. I had, um, I was born, yeah, with uh, too much oxygen and, you know, they called it, they called it retrolento fibroplasia back then. Now they, they call it retino- retinopathy of prematurity. I'm not sure I buy that change, but at any rate, that's another whole, whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I started with an itinerant teacher who came into the regular public classroom a few times a week and, and uh, taught me Braille. I started reading Braille in kindergarten, loved it, um, started learning various Braille writers. My, I think we had one at home, an old, I think it's the Hall Braille writer. And wow. my, mother, my mother had ordered a Perkins Braille writer for me when I was born. And it took six years for that to come. It was on such a wait list back then. Amazing. Mm. Um, and so I got my Perkins Braille writer probably around first grade and she also had started to learn Braille. I was really glad she didn't keep up with it because I didn't want her to read all my, my personal diary and serial <laughs> things. <laughs> right. <laughs> but she had also had a slate and stylus. So I was exposed early to learning the slate and stylus. And I still today carry one around in my purse. I, I, I often will write little grocery lists that I want to have in Braille rather than having to hear something rather than to carry a Braille display. And I'll sometimes write little poems or little notes to myself. Um, but I used a Braille writer. Um, in third grade, I learned to type on a regular typewriter. And I, thank God I did. I think that's really great for keyboarding now. But I, I typed all through school and college, all my papers, without really, you know, knowing exactly the bottom of the page and, and the margins exactly. I typed a few papers in stencil. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, after, <laughs> around uh, in college years, I, I was exposed to the Opticon, and I went and I got trained in that, and I heard the Dancing Dots uh, person talk about the Opticon when, on the podcast, taking pictures of letters, Wow, yes. another Opticon yes. user. Wow, okay. Uh, yeah, and my Opticon is plugged in on my desk. I still will use it. If I want to try to read something that isn't scanning well, uh, but one of the best uses for me is if I print out something and let's say there's a letterhead, I want to see which end is up. I want to see where on the page my what I've printed out starts. I want to see where the letterhead is. I want to um, uh, sometimes, if I print out labels, I want to see how they print it out and if, if I print it on the right side of the paper, um, <laughs> <laughs> things like that, and how those labels appear. Um, so, you know, to me, an Opticon does not, a scanner does not take the place of an Opticon. Um, so anyway, around um, 86, I got hired 
for, at a publishing company, and uh, DBS Blind Services, Division of Blind Services counselor at that time said, well, I think we should maybe see if, open your case and see what you need for this job. And I said, <laughs> oh, I just, I just need another Rolodex and, you know, I, I'll be fine. I don't need anything. Mm. She, said, <laughs> she said, I think you need a Versa Braille. <laughs> wow. I was blown away. When I saw the Versa Braille, it was the two. But mm. when I saw that Versa Braille, I mean, I started to cry. I was just amazed to have my hands on that kind of access. It was a major door opener. And from then, I, from right around that same time after I went and got trained, I, I mean, it was new for me. I didn't, know, I didn't know what a floppy disk felt like. I didn't know what a hard disk was. Mm -hmm. I, I thought MSG was the additive that was in food. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't, I bought a computer and I really, could not imagine ever using a 20 meg hard drive. I mm. mean, I thought that sounded like something a big business would have. I didn't think that I would ever use such a thing. So, so I bought that computer with, it was an XP with a Votrax synthesizer. The Votrax would not cuss. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe they had it censored. You know, if you type that SH word, it said sugar. <laughs> well, I think what's exciting me is the whole fact that uh, you had the whole thought process of the 20 megabyte drive and now you got two terabytes and, you know, who would have thought, you know, next is going to be pedaflips in the home. So go ahead. I'm sorry. So I was using, it's all right. I was using DOS. I bought a Braille printer, reverse the point that sounded like a little machine gun. It went da, 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 mm. as it printed. <laughs> and, um, I, and then later on, I guess it was in the, somewhere in the mid nineties, maybe a little bit later, I was, you know, knowing that we needed to switch to windows mm. and I went to get windows and I was really afraid of it. I had heard, you know, Oh, it's going to be terrible. I took to it really well and liked it a lot and thought, well, this is, this is easy, you know, and um, when so, so Debbie, how did you overcome that fear of the unknown and then being able to master it? What's what's a couple of action steps you took to to make that happen? Um, one of them was having a wizard, uh, my good friend, my good friend Rick Alfaro, who was when I uh, around the late eighties. I was taking my Versa Braille online for the first time, and I, I went to CompuServe, and then I found out that he had a bulletin board, and I, I had heard about him, and I went there, and we started, we started texting, and I was so blown away to write and read in Braille and have real-time chat. I mean, it was like, I, I was just, it was orgasm. I had have to tell you it was like I was in ecstasy I could not believe so he and I became friends and he took me by the hand and just kept showing me things and I would get freaked out I would get I would be in tears sometimes and he would say you know what it's just initiation and <laughs> today we we still laugh about that we still say you know what initiation goes on forever <laughs> absolutely so Talk to him. I love to interview him for the show. Um, you guys are going back to uh, the Optelec days and uh, the Versa Braille, and I love to get a lot of that um, older iterative uh, technology and the folks who used it on the show. Um, but Debbie, do me one favor. Actually, okay. two. Okay. Um, so your audio cut out a little bit, so stay right there where you're at. And then remember, Oprah is coming on next. So we need that audio to be the absolute best quality that we possibly can. So I'm going to need you to stop moving. OK. OK. All right. Well, Debbie, this show is definitely about you. Um, we are going to pivot a little bit. I want to know what's your desire for the blindness community? OK, well, um, I would say certainly I mean, I think I look at access in a very different way because I'm, I'm holistic. I look at access as wanting blind people to have access in every sense of the word, whether it's access to one's own body, access to in, 
information, access to other people. Uh, I want people to feel, I want blind people to feel equal to and not need to feel like we need to be the same as other people. And so that has to do also with self-esteem mm-hmm. and social skills and, and um, certainly rights on a variety of levels. You know, I'm wondering if my ceiling fan is giving you um, some sound. Do you want me to go and turn that off? Um, if you're not going to be too hot, we can see if that yeah, is the see, concern. I don't know what else is giving you um, interruption or interference, but let's see. I'm sorry for, for editing kinds of things there that you'll... Oh, no, we're not going to edit it out. Oh, we're gonna let folks know that there you go. That sounds a lot better. Does it? Okay. All right. Now, if I'm sitting here in my office sweating, then you can do the interview and sweat a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sweating. It's early in the day. It's mostly to keep the stuffiness out of the air, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, those are pretty much. I, I have done a lot of training over the years to bridge the gap between blind people and. Uh, people who are sighted, people who are temporarily able-bodied. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, and really, I approach it not just from, you need to know this about blind people, but you need to, I want sighted people to focus on what is it like to feel treated like you're different and what happens to communication when people treat you like you are different or uh you know, on the outside, separate from, second-class citizen, whatever, and then to go to blind people and say, okay, now listen, you know, to here's some things that you might want to think about to make an even better impression. Wow. So we're going to dive a little bit more into that later on in the interview. Um, you talked a lot about the various technologies that you've used along your way. What's exciting you right now as far as technology for the blind? The iPhone, the iPhone, the iPhone, the iPhone. And the probably iPhone. not the iPhone, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. <laughs> wow. So did you hear the new changes that are coming up with? Uh, iOS 7 and the new uh, releases of the iPhone uh, 5C and 5S? I have heard about this, yes. What's exciting you about that? Well, um, probably improvements to Siri and um, and uh, certainly new voices to play around with, um, faster processing, any kind of better um you know, better uh, camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't get to upgrade yet. I have a five, but I have another year. Uh, but I will get iOS seven. So that's real exciting. Yeah, I think for me, it's the uh, fingerprint reading on the five S. Okay. Yeah. So um, just the ability to be able to turn your phone on with the fingerprint, the ability to purchase items with the fingerprint. Uh, reader, I, I believe, will be very exciting and very innovative. So I think that's going to be a, a great um, feature. If you're getting the 5S, then you're going to be getting faster processing. Yeah, faster processing. And um, But is it really faster if the operating system now requires more, you know? Hmm. So is it probably still the same, just a faster processor, but the operating system is still holding it down. So, you know, it's just only keeping up with each other. I don't know. But So do you think that that process, if it's requiring more for the operating system, do you think it's going to slow the five down? Uh, it's a great, great possibility. I mean, the five has a great processor in it already. And I guess it depends on what you're processing. You know, if it's uh, video or audio or photo editing, um, it'll be different than, you know, hey, I just want to open up my email or I want to surf the web. So, you know, processor speeds, you know, and the benchmarks are, you know, just all over the board. And, you know, they have to come up with something 50% mm-hmm. faster, um, you know, than your dad's iPhone type thing. So, but it'll be great, whatever it is. And I can't wait till uh, next Wednesday. Um, and then when the new phones are released, I am that guy. It'll be <laughs> in the line, you know, the day before for my gold 
iPhone 5S. I can't wait to hear about it. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Yeah. And uh, for all of you all out there who want to hear and see our thoughts, we'll be doing um, the top 10 best features of iOS 7, a feature per day starting sometime uh, next Wednesday after iOS 7 is released. So um, this will be coming out soon and you'll be able to not only um, get those tips and trips, tips and trips, it's time for vacation, Debbie. (laughs) tips and tricks <laughs> on our blog at fedoraoutlier.com slash blog so Debbie tell us a little bit about how you're striving to invoke change for the blind in the future well I would say uh, continuing with the kinds of things that I mentioned uh, anytime I get to talk, talk to uh, sighted people I say things like people who are blind, people first, uh, any kind of a disability or difference second. Um, And I talk about vision in the mind, you know, and I remind sighted people, they'll say, oh gosh, you know, uh, what do you mean you say you see this or that? Or, or, you know, they'll say, well, how do you read that braille? I'll say, well, how do you read those blank pages? (laughs) And, And I'll say, you know, vision is in the mind when you're on the phone with somebody and they're telling you something, you say, oh, I see what you mean. You don't have a camera in front of you, probably not. Uh, you might, but chances are you you see it in your mind. So I say I'm always doing things like that to make it a teachable moment, even if it is saying to sighted people, you know what? I don't feel like answering questions right now. I want to get to know you as a person, and and whether I live alone is personal, or or you know personal you know answerings questions about from a to z Mm. um i don't want to and i'm not working the night shift right now i don't want to i don't want (laughs) to fill out paperwork right now or fill out a survey right now Mm. so i will i will make it a teachable moment and then with blind people i mean and actually with both i am counseling people globally on skype and by phone Mm -hmm. and um and you know i i feel like uh some of that is helping people who are blind really sometimes unearth a lot of self-esteem issues. One of my clients uh, spoke recently about a lot of the dis-ease about blindness that he internalized from his family, a lot of the uh, fear that his family had regarding his blindness. He internalized it, and he learned to feel really frightened, and um, it, it affected his self-esteem. He he learned to feel like he was a terrible person. Mm -hmm. So spending a lot of time kind of untangling those things. Another one of my clients has been dealing with um, same-sex issues. And so helping that, and in another country, so helping that person to, you know, find resources, but also to, actually, they went and found them on their own, but to feel okay. Mm-hmm. And to and to feel like, you know what, uh, just because I can't see what, you know, the eye con make eye contact with people, I can't see uh, uh, the facial expressions and and maybe I haven't felt like I had rights in the same way as other people, you know, for for people who are blind to find that. Yes, in fact, yes, uh, we sometimes have to create those rights, but we we do have them. Wow. It's something you say it that I caught. Um, a hold to when you was talking about the first client is that they had to learn how to have low self-esteem. And that is a behavior that's built up and snowballed throughout the journey. And then you begin to tell yourself this story of unworthiness and, you know, people don't understand and they don't like me. And it just, perpetuates throughout every aspect of your life until you become this person that you really don't know who and what you are. And then you speak about untangling those things and those myths and those beliefs. And I think 
No, I don't think. I feel that that is so great to have someone out there like you that really can bring balance to an individual's life who's dealing with a disability on top of self-esteem issues, on top of social problems and concerns and, you know, all of that. So, you know, how is this work for you? Is it is it something that you're passionate about? Is it something that, you know, just really, really resonates to you? Tell us your story on oh. how, how you had to untangle yourself in order to be able to help others. Okay, well, sure. Yeah, it, it is something I'm hugely passionate about. I mean, I, you know, people have said, oh, you're doing massage. What, what about your counseling? And I've said, you know what, I'm I'm always doing that too. I'm always teaching. My therapy hat is is always on, but hopefully in a very user friendly way. And yes, um, you know, I grew up with blindness since birth, uh, but also I grew up in an alcoholic home, a very violent home. And uh, you know, I I grew up where my mother was uh, felt like you know you're not entitled to an opinion. You're a child and. So I had to really learn to find my voice. I had to learn to, uh, um, you know, find appropriate ways to express. And I and and you know what is going to help win, make a win-win in a situation. You know, you were saying how it snowballs when someone believes those negative things, but also in a world where people are afraid, where blindness is one of the scariest predicaments that they can ever imagine uh, themselves to be in, where that dis-ease that they feel comes back to us. It's projected back to us. So when we hear that from jobs where we end up like, no, 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 uh, you know, either discrimination or just rejection, rejection in love, rejection in uh, social situations, feeling like a bump on a log, you know, trying to mingle I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, to me, it's an ongoing process and even of discernment. Where do I feel, where do I feel safe? Where do I feel accepted uh, socially? Uh, Where do I want to, where do I want to be? And even on certain days, I will think, okay, do I want to spend my my money on Marta Mobility and go somewhere, am I going to feel like I'm a part of, of the situation, a part of the social setting, or am I going to feel like, hi, uh, hi, Debbie, uh, here, have a seat, and then everyone walks off. Am I going to be able to uh, roam around and interact, or is it going to be more challenging with the size of the group? So I, I, to me, discernment is very important in a day-to-day way of Uh, you know, getting out there and finding the best places. And it's an ongoing challenge. Yeah, and it is a challenge. And I think when you look at it, it's how you deal with that challenge. You know, 90 percent of it is, you know, how you deal with it. 10 percent is the, the problem. And I remember when I went completely blind and mind you, when I was growing up, Um, I was always told in six months, if you don't have this operation, you're going to go blind. Um, You're about to go blind. And it's, you know, 16, 20 years later, never went blind. Um, And then all of a sudden it happens. And it was a gradual thing. I didn't realize that I was slowly losing my sight because every day I would pretty much do the same thing mechanically. I would get out the car. Um, I wasn't driving, but I would get out the car. I walk the same seven steps to go to the door. I would walk to my desk. I would do my job with zoom on and you know i didn't notice that you know every time i inch up the magnification that you know this was a sign that i was losing sight so finally it it went i realized it you know i went through one day of this pity party because i believe that my parents have always prepared me for that doomsday kind of inadvertently you know with things like the handicap is in your mind. You can mm-hmm. do whatever you want to do. Don't mm-hmm. worry about what people think of you. Worry about what you think of yourself. Things like that prepared mm-hmm. me for that day. And, you know, a great speaker has always said if you spill the milk, don't cry over it. And nobody really, really 
took that down to the ground level. But guess what? The milk is already spilled. The only thing you can do at this point is clean it up. Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. that's how I took my blindness. Look, I'm I'm blind. I mm-hmm. I enjoyed being able to see, but at this point, I'm blind. What are you gonna do moving forward? And I think that's the legacy that you know we should think about. You know, as we go through different things. Yeah, you had a alcoholic family background, but does that define you? You know, abuse, does that define you? That should make you more giving, more understanding, more passionate, more caring um, if you want to resolve the problem. So I think what you said is great. Um, Any more good advice for those who are struggling um, with, you know, things? Well, I would say that I, I agree totally with you on the end result. And I would say that that's where I think that I can be helpful because sometimes people do need to grieve and sometimes people need to uh, look back and assimilate, okay, what did I get from this experience? What have I learned? And or how can I bridge over into finding uh, greater empathy within myself. You know, I I really believe that uh, very much like you said, what we go through, I mean, it it gives us what I I call wisdom and empathy, living in the we, wisdom and empathy. So what I call it research too. I mean, where's, where's the data, you know, of what, what you got from your experience, what I got from my experience. There's lots of data that we gain uh, that helps us no, okay, this is what I've learned, but now these are my tools that I can take and use. But different people have different needs, and some have pockets of grief and pain. Now, I agree, uh, it's not a good idea to stay stuck in that, and that's where some of the things I use today, uh, I, it's globally called energy work, but there's things like the emotional freedom technique, EFT, Um, which is an incredible way of getting through things more rapidly. It it has to do with some tapping points on the body and some statements that help to get whatever is stuck out of the energy field. And the founder of that, Gary Craig, found years ago doing a lot of research, he said, why are people going to therapy and they're not getting better? Many of them are just milling around, kind of, you know, stuck in that old wine barrel, sloshing around in their stuff, and why aren't they getting better? And he found that when people learned this technique that he further put together based on um, thought field therapy by uh, James Callahan, uh, anyway, all that to say, he found that people could get through things and uh, not need to keep on looping back through all that muckety muck. So I use that, and I use something called um, Bach flower remedies, which are not aromatic, but they're flower essences that help to uh, lift certain feelings. So that if if something somebody's going through some anger or some sadness, taking these essences uh, can really help. They don't they don't change. The picture, there may still be, oh, I don't, I didn't like what happened, but it lifts that, uh, that angst right out so that a person can, can uh, go forward and have some mobility to move through that, that situation. Yeah, and I like what you said about the whole experience thing. You know, one of my favorite sayings is that a man with experience is not at the whim of one with an opinion. You know, and just to break that down to the ground level, if you've been through something, then you can help someone else go through it. If all you know is, you know, someone who's been through it or someone who knows about it, you don't know about it yourself. But if you've been through an alcoholic family and you know how traumatic that can be you can definitely walk someone through you know coming up out of that story and to begin to tell a new story and open up a new chapter in, in their life and I really Debbie feel like this interview is God sent I just sent out an email about 15 minutes before getting you on the show about a retreat that I want to put on um, for the blind and I titled it 
mind, body, and goals. And my vision for that is to be able to deal with the mind, have someone like yourself uh, speak and counsel um, individuals who, you know, have concerns um, and then deal with the body, have uh, medic manicures, pedicures, massages. Um, and I want to do that first, even though I named it mind, body and goals, um, you know, get the body relaxed and then deal with the mind. And then on Saturday, we have a workshop on employment. You know, what does it mean um, to apply for a job in today's economy um, and various sponsors and just this nice retreat, something that, in my opinion, in the state of Georgia, I know hasn't really been done. And I really feel like um, you would be perfect for something like that with just the whole massage, um, the whole therapy, you know, and just the whole world view that you have. So cool. what's your thoughts? Oh, I think that's great. I think I, I think it's very important. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't like their bodies. I actually think that a lot of people who are blind are not taught. We're not given messages from the beginning. This is your body. You have a right to it. You need to take care of it. And um, actually, lots of kids, I mean, who are sighted don't even get those, those messages. I think our, our body is a vehicle for our expression and our experience. And our mind and our body work so intricately together that, yeah, I mean, there's just really a need to address in a variety of ways uh, the relationship and, and to appreciate and to, and to feed in, on many levels the body-mind uh, connection. And there's a lot out there on body-mind connection and, and uh, ways that, um, gosh, books and techniques that, you know, address all of that. And, Certainly, yeah, I'd be happy to um, talk with you more about it and, and get involved in, in that. All right. So we're looking at sometime 2014, maybe somewhere on the beach where it's tranquil. I'm thinking Tybee Island, somewhere like that. Yay. Yeah. Okay. okay cool. uh, uh, all cool. right. All right. Seems like we have something in the works. Cool. So, <laughs> Debbie, this has truly been a very, very exciting interview, but we'll have to bring it to a close. Um, Oprah, by the way, is not available still however you still have me so hopefully i did a great well, job you did a good job but listen and you got me to you know you wanted me to not move and all that with all these promises about oprah now i'm gonna have to work that through <laughs> okay okay well you know you're a gold setter and um i think if we talk to enough people we might be able to get her on i'm still working on stevie wonder by the way so oh, good. you know if you ever hear stevie wonder we're one step closer to oprah so there you have it <laughs> so debbie give us one parting piece of advice tell us how we can reach you and then we'll say goodbye okay i want to um encourage the world to get on twitter <laughs> i think twitter is phenomenal and if i could get more people off of email and onto Twitter. Twitter is, I think, important. Uh, I think social isolation is still a huge problem, not only for blind people, but for uh, people in, in many ways in our society. But um, I think Twitter is a wonderful bridge. Uh, it is a wonderful way to make friends. It's been a wonderful way for me to get uh, more clients. And, um, and I would just really recommend it. I would, um, you know, I would um, also, like I said, recommend that iPhone. And, and I guess I would just say, you know, be the best person you can be and know that whatever you're going through, you're never alone, really never alone. Right. Now, how can we reach you? Okay. Oh, yeah, you did ask that. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, you can contact... Um, you can use Twitter at Debbie Hazelton, and that's D E B B I E H A Z E E L T O N. And you can you can uh, find me at debbiehazelton.com. That's um, just debbiehazelton.com, and there is a, a contact me uh, link there. And um, I'm just real happy to be in touch with any of you. Absolutely. All right, so I'd like to give a big old thanks to Aaron Linkson, our podcast producer and sound engineer, Debbie Hazelton, our honored spotlighted guest. 
Um, if you guys like what you hear, then give us a good rating in iTunes, and we'll say goodbye. Thank you. In my traditional closing, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you are right. Think pennies, get pennies. Think dollars, get dollars. See you on the other side. This has been a Yuga Music Group production. Website, 81x.com slash Yuga slash X. The Yuga Music Group can be reached at 678-608-8969. All rights reserved.